The Antidote to the Black Swan I want to live happily in a world I don't understand. Black swans, capitalized, are large-scale, unpredictable, and irregular events of massive consequence, unpredicted by a certain observer, and such unpredictor is generally called the turkey when he is both surprised and harmed by these events. I have made the claim that most of history comes from black swan events. While we worry about fine-tuning our understanding of the ordinary, and hence develop models, theories, or representations that cannot possibly track them or measure the possibility of these shocks. Black swans hijack our brains, making us feel we sort of or almost predicted them, because they are retrospectively explainable. We don't realize the role of these swans in life because of this illusion of predictability. Life is more, a lot more, labyrinthine than shown in our memory. Our minds are in the business of turning history into something smooth and linear, which makes us underestimate randomness. But when we see it, we fear it and overreact. Because of this fear and thirst for order, some human systems, by disrupting the invisible or not-so-visible logic of things, tend to be exposed to harm from black swans and almost never get any benefit. You get pseudo-order when you seek order. You only get a measure of order and control when you embrace randomness. Complex systems are full of interdependencies, hard to detect, and nonlinear responses. Nonlinear means that when you double the dose of, say, a medication, or when you double the number of employees in a factory, you don't get twice the initial effect, but rather a lot more or a lot less. Two weekends in Philadelphia are not twice as pleasant as a single one. I've tried. When the response is plotted on a graph, it does not show as a straight line, linear, rather as a curve. In such environment, simple causal associations are misplaced. It is hard to see how things work by looking at single parts. Man-made complex systems tend to develop cascades and runaway chains of reactions that decrease, even eliminate, predictability and cause outsized events. So the modern world may be increasing in technological knowledge, but, paradoxically, it is making things a lot more unpredictable. Now, for reasons that have to do with the increase of the artificial, the move away from ancestral and natural models, and the loss in robustness owing to complications in the design of everything, the role of black swans is increasing. Further, we are victims to a new disease, called in this book Neomania, that makes us build black swan vulnerable systems. Progress. An annoying aspect of the black swan problem, in fact, the central and largely missed point, is that the odds of rare events are simply not computable. We know a lot less about hundred-year floods than five-year floods. Model error swells when it comes to small probabilities. The rarer the event, the less tractable, and the less we know about how frequent its occurrence. Yet, the rarer the event the more confident these scientists involved in predicting, modeling, and using PowerPoint in conferences with equations in multicolor background have become. It is of great help that Mother Nature, thanks to its anti-fragility, is the best expert at rare events, and the best manager of black swans. In its billions of years, it succeeded in getting here without much command and control instruction from an Ivy League-educated director nominated by a search committee. Antifragility is not just the antidote to the black swan. Understanding it makes us less intellectually fearful in accepting the role of these events as necessary for history, technology, knowledge, everything. Robust is not robust enough. Consider that Mother Nature is not just safe. It is aggressive in destroying and replacing, in selecting and reshuffling. When it comes to random events, Robust is certainly not good enough. In the long run, everything with the most minute vulnerability breaks, given the ruthlessness of time. Yet our planet has been around for perhaps four billion years, and convincingly, robustness can't just be it. You need perfect robustness for a crack not to end up crashing the system. Given the unattainability of perfect robustness, we need a mechanism by which the system regenerates itself continuously by using, rather than suffering from, random events, unpredictable shocks, stressors, and volatility. 
the anti-fragile gains from prediction errors in the long run. If you follow this idea to its conclusion, then many things that gain from randomness should be dominating the world today, and things that are hurt by it should be gone. Well, this turns out to be the case. We have the illusion that the world functions thanks to program design, university research, and bureaucratic funding, but there is compelling, very compelling evidence to show that this is an illusion, the illusion I call lecturing birds how to fly. Technology is the result of anti-fragility, exploited by risk-takers in the form of tinkering and trial and error, with nerd-driven design confined to the backstage. Engineers and tinkerers develop things while history books are written by academics. We will have to refine historical interpretations of growth, innovation, and many such things. On the Measurability of Some Things Fragility is quite measurable, risk not so at all, particularly risk associated with rare events. Outside of casinos and some narrowly defined areas, such as man-made situations and constructions. I said that we can estimate, even measure, fragility and anti-fragility. While we cannot calculate risks and probabilities of shocks and rare events, no matter how sophisticated we get, risk management as practiced is the study of an event taking place in the future, and only some economists and other lunatics can claim, against experience, to measure the future incidents of these rare events, with suckers listening to them, against experience and the track record of such claims. But fragility and anti-fragility are part of the current property of an object, a coffee table, a company, an industry, a country, a political system. We can detect fragility, see it, even in many cases measure it, or at least measure comparative fragility with a small error, while comparisons of risk have been so far unreliable. You cannot say with any reliability that a certain remote event or shock is more likely than another, unless you enjoy deceiving yourself. But you can state with a lot more confidence that an object or a structure is more fragile than another, should a certain event happen. You can easily tell that your grandmother is more fragile to abrupt changes in temperature than you that some military dictatorship is more fragile than Switzerland should political change happen, that a bank is more fragile than another should a crisis occur, or that a poorly built modern building is more fragile than the Cathedral of Chartres should an earthquake happen. And, centrally, you can even make the prediction of which one will last longer. Instead of a discussion of risk, which is both predictive and sissy, I advocate the notion of fragility, which is not predictive, and, unlike risk, has an interesting word that can describe its functional opposite, the non-sissy concept of anti-fragility. To measure anti-fragility, there is a philosopher's stone-like recipe using a compact and simplified rule that allows us to identify it across domains, from health to the construction of societies. We have been unconsciously exploiting anti-fragility in practical life and, consciously, rejecting it particularly in intellectual life.